a sealing message. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Revelation 7 verses 2 and 3 The sealing work here introduced has its consummation at the close of probation. Then the last message of salvation has gone to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, but it has been rejected by the many. Those who accept this message are sanctified by it, are sealed for the kingdom. Then the door of mercy is closed, probation is ended, and the decree goes forth, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. Revelation 22 11 The seal brought by the angel ascending from the east, is to be placed upon the foreheads of the servants of our God. It must, therefore, represent some message sent to them, the acceptance of which separates them from the world and marks them as God's peculiar people. The climax is reached when their obedience to this sealing message has fitted them for translation when Jesus comes. This work of sealing is the culmination of the threefold message of Revelation 14. It brings out a company staunch, tried, and true, of whom it is said, Here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Verse 12 Their unquestioning obedience presents them to God as more than conquerors through Him that loved us. These characteristics become the badge or seal of their service to God. What is a seal? The word seal in the original is defined as a signaturing, a mark, stamp, badge, a token, a pledge. Webster defines the word as an engraved or inscribed stamp, used for making impressions in wax or other soft substances, to be attached to a document or otherwise used by way of authentication or security. One author states that a seal is used always in connection with some law or enactment that demands obedience, or upon documents that are to be made legal, or subject to the provisions of law. The idea of law is inseparable from a seal. Most legal documents are not binding unless they bear the seal of the notary. The decrees of kings and governments require the seal of state to make them valid and obligatory. The seal attests the authenticity and authority of the document to which it is attached. The Seal of God A record of God's law is found in the statute book of His Word, the Bible. On Sinai it was graven on tables of stone by the finger of God. Where in that code do we find the seal of the lawgiver, giving His name? disclosing his identity, and stating his authority. The first three commandments contain the name of God, but they do not designate who he is. Paul says, There be gods many, and lords many. 1 Corinthians 8-5 Idolaters can claim these precepts as the law of their gods of wood and stone. The heathen of Africa can claim them for the gods of their fetish worship. There is nothing to designate the true God in these three precepts. Passing over the fourth commandment, the fifth contains the words, Lord God, but does not in any way define them. The last five precepts do not contain the name of God at all. Turning back to the fourth, we find the desired information, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. One writer states that in the fourth commandment the author of this law has designated who he is, the extent of his dominion, and his right to rule, for every created intelligence must at once assent that he who is the creator of all has the right to demand obedience from all his creatures. Thus with the fourth commandment in its place, this wonderful document, the Decalogue, the only document among men which God ever wrote with his own finger, has a signature, it has that which renders it intelligible and authentic, it has a seal. But without the fourth commandment, it lacks all these things. The scriptures speak plainly as to this claim regarding the fourth commandment. The Lord said to Israel, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Exodus 31, 13 In Bible parlance the terms sign, token, mark, and seal are synonymous. But let us not think of this instruction entirely as pertaining to the little Israel that was overthrown at the destruction of Jerusalem. Paul says to the Romans, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, 
in the Spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Romans 2 verses 28 and 29. To the Gentiles of Galatia the Apostle writes, If ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3 29. And in his epistle to the church at Ephesus he says that the Gentiles should be fellowers, and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Ephesians 3 6 Only by taking the place which the Jews would have occupied if they had remained faithful, can the Gentiles share in this promise made to Abraham, and by this promise alone are we saved. The position that God has made one mode of salvation for the Jew, and has given a new gospel for the Gentile is absolutely untenable. The believing Gentiles are grat into the stock of Israel and thus partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Read Romans 11 verses 16 to 24. The effects of this sealing message are summed up by you, Smith in the following words, having now ascertained that the seal of God is his holy Sabbath, having his name, we are prepared to proceed with the application by the scenes introduced in the verses before us, namely, the four winds apparently about to blow, bringing war and trouble upon the land, and this work restrained till the servants of God should be sealed, as though a preparatory work must be done for them to save them from this trouble. We are reminded of the houses of the Israelites marked with the blood of the Paschal Lamb, and spared as the destroying angel passed over to slay the firstborn of the Egyptians, Exodus 12, also of the mark made by the man with the writer's ink horn, Ezekiel 9 upon all those who were to be spared by the men with the slaughtering weapons who followed after, and we conclude that the seal of God, here placed upon his servants, is some distinguishing mark, or religious characteristic, through which they will be exempted from the judgments of God that fall on the wicked around them. As we have found the seal of God in the fourth commandment, the inquiry follows, does the observance of that commandment involve any peculiarity in religious practice? Yes a very marked and striking one. It is one of the most singular facts to be met with in religious history that in an age of such boasted gospel light as the present, when the influence of Christianity is so powerful and widespread, one of the most striking peculiarities in practice which a person can adopt, and one of the greatest crosses he can't take up, even in the most enlightened and Christian lands, is the simple observance of the law of God. For the fourth commandment requires the observance of the seventh day of each week as the Sabbath of the Lord, but almost all Christendom through the combined influences of paganism and the papacy, have been beguiled into the keeping of the first day. A person has but to commence the observance of the day enjoined in the commandment, and a mark of peculiarity is upon him at once. He is distinct alike from the professedly religious world and the unconverted world. We conclude then, that the angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, is a divine messenger in charge of the work of reform to be carried on among men in reference to the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. The agents of this work on the earth are of course ministers of Christ, for to men is given the commission of instructing their fellow men in Bible truth, but as there is order in the execution of all the divine counsels, it seems not improbable that a literal angel may have the charge and oversight of this work. We have already noticed the chronology of this work as locating it in our own time. This is further evident from the fact that, as the next event after the sealing of the servants of God, we behold them before the throne, with palms of victory in their hands. The sealing is therefore the last work to be accomplished for them prior to their redemption. Daniel in the Revelation pp. 442 443. The Mark of the Beast. As the seal of God is the badge of entry into God's everlasting kingdom, so the mark of the beast subjects those who bear it to the awful punishments of the last day. Of such it is written, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Revelation 14 verses 9 and 10 The worship of the beast and his image must be a heinous sin in the eyes of Jehovah, for the penalties against it are the most severe of any recorded between the lids of the Bible. The receiving of the mark must take place at the same time that the servants of God are sealed, namely, in the last days. What is this mark? This symbol of a mark is taken from an ancient custom as described by Bishop Newton. It was customary among the ancients for servants to receive the mark of their master, and soldiers of their general, 
and those who were devoted to any particular deity, of the particular deity to whom they were devoted. These marks were usually impressed on their right hand or on their forehead, and consisted of some hieroglyphic character, or of the name expressed in vulgar letters, or of the name disguised in numerical letters, according to the fancy of the imposer. Dissertations on the Prophecies Volume J, P. 241. According to Prito, Ptolemy Philopater commanded that all Jews of Alexandria who applied for citizenship, should have the mark of an ivy leaf, the badge of his god, Bacchus, impressed upon them with the hot iron, connection volume 2, p. j. 8. The original word for mark is denned as a graving, sculpture, a mark cut in or stamped. This ancient custom of placing a significant mark upon individuals is used as a type of a moral mark which will be so indelibly impressed upon the characters of the rebels against the law and government of God that it will be plain in the sight of all earthly and heavenly intelligences, and separate them from the righteous as plainly as the distinguishing brand of the ancients separated those who received it from their fellows. What is the mark of the beast? Commentators generally agree that the beast here mentioned is the papacy. The mark of the beast must be some some form or observance by which the authority of that power is acknowledged. To what characteristic of that power does this mark respond? Daniel in describing the papal power under the symbol of the little horn, says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. 11 Daniel 7 25 The papacy has in past ages been the ruling factor in many earthly governments and has not only thought to change their statutes but has actually done so at will. So this attempted change of law cannot refer to human statutes. But when this power reaches forth its sacrilegious arm to change the precepts of Jehovah the coming king it encounters a power it cannot subvert. It can think it has accomplished the change, but in point of fact God's law stands intact. This power can lead nearly the whole world to follow in its errors, but the words of the Savior. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, bounds beyond which no earthly power can actually pass. Whatever claims may be set up to the contrary are only futile imaginings. God will search them out by and by. Paul refers to this power as that man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 and 4 an earthly power might assume equality with Jehovah by claiming for its precepts equal authority with the precepts of the Creator, but here we have a power presented which exalts itself above God. It asserts its power to change the law of God, and demands and enforces, so far as possible, its changed law in opposition to God's original law. The mark of the beast is given to those who worship the beast. The seal of God is placed upon those who worship God. How shall it be determined which power the people are worshipping? This is distinctly shown by the law they are keeping. By an examination of the law of God side by side with the law as changed by the papacy, see page 220, this feature is made very clear. Hence when the question is asked, what constitutes the mark of the beast? The answer is plain, the mark of the beast is the change which the beast has attempted to make in the fourth commandment. Daniel do not say that this power would make a new law but that it would think to change some law already in existence. God has but one unchanging law, the Ten Commandments. This law the papacy has endeavored to change, by substituting in the Fourth Commandment the first day Sabbath of the papacy for the seventh day Sabbath of Jehovah. By this attempted change the seal of God has been stripped from his law, and the mark of the beast has been substituted. The evidence of God's authority as Creator was removed and the badge of the power of the papacy to change was put in its place. This power does not claim that God instituted or commanded this change in the Sabbath, but that it was made by the Church and history substantiates their claim. A few statements from reliable Catholic writers will make plain this claim to authority. 1 The Word of God commandeth the seventh day to be the Sabbath of our Lord, and to be kept holy, you Protestants, without any precept of Scripture, change it to the first day of the week, only authorized by our traditions. Divers English Puritans oppose, against this point, that the observation of the first day is proved out of Scripture, where it is said, the first day of the week, Acts 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, and Revelation 1, 10. Have they not spun a fair thread in quoting these places? If we should produce no better for purgatory and prayers for the dead, 
invocation of saints, and the like, they might have good cause, indeed, to laugh us to scorn. For where was it written that these were Sabbath days in which those meetings were kept, or where is it ordained that they should be always observed, or, which is the sum of all, where is it decreed that the observance of the first day should abrogate, or abolish, the sanctifying of the seventh day, which God commanded everlastingly to be kept holy, not one of these is expressed in the written word of God. Treatise of Thirty Controversies In the face of the foregoing claims the Sunday-keeping Protestant churches are silent. Many acknowledge that there is no Bible authority for the change, but accept it solely upon the authority of the Church. For many years the Catholics have widely published an offer of $1,000 to anyone who would, from the Bible, produce evidence that the Sabbath has been changed from the seventh to the first day of the week, but no one has taken it. The Sunday Sabbath is a man-made institution and the papacy boasts of the change as the badge, or mark of its authority, as shown by the following. Question, what does God ordain by the commandment? Answer, he ordained that we sanctify, in a special manner, this day on which he rested from the labor of creation. Question, what is this day of rest? Answer, the seventh day of the week, or Saturday, for he employed six days in creation, and rested on the seventh, Gen. 2-2. Heb 4 1, etc. Question, it is, then, Saturday we should sanctify, in order to obey the ordinance of God? Answer, during the old law, Saturday was the day sanctified, but the Church, instructed by Jesus Christ, and directed by the Spirit of God, has substituted Sunday for Saturday, so now we sanctify the first, not the seventh day. Sunday means, and now is, the day of the Lord. Catechism of the Christian Religion, by Stephen Keenan, Boston, Patrick Donahue, 1857, p. 206. Jehovah has given his Sabbath as the badge of his authority as Creator. The little horn power of Daniel 7:25, which we have identified as the papacy, not only ruthlessly tramples upon this divine institution, making God's chosen Sabbath the busiest day of the week, but it has erected in its place a counterfeit institution to which it points as evidence of authority to command men under sin. As in the fourth commandment as given by the Creator we find the seal of God, so in that precept as applied to the false Sabbath by an apostate power, we find the badge of the papacy, the mark of the beast.